Hello, everyone. On this week before Christmas, uh, again, welcome aboard to uh, our weekly chats. I enjoy these. I know a lot of people watch later, which is great. Um, and I've gotten a lot of feedback. Actually, for this week, I got a couple questions, which was um, exciting, uh, about Christmas and Christmas history. So we'll get right into it. First, I want to thank everyone who um, supported Carol Cade this year. It was a great year. The weather was perfect, despite the weather reports. Um, and so uh, we had a good time on Main Street in East Aurora with the 50th annual event. So, um, and of course I'm involved with that and enjoy being involved with that. So thanks for everybody who supports it. It takes a team. And I know last year, last week we talked about the history of Carol Cade and some folks had uh, reached out about it. So um, it went very well. Um, so again, this week before Christmas, we're going to talk a little bit about Christmas history. I thought it'd be fun. Uh, we have some topics that are in the hopper, so to speak, um, and I promise we'll get to them with some great um, suggestions from people, including um, we had a vote here at this, in the East Aurora School District on a capital project that barely won, barely was accepted last week. Um, a couple votes gone the other way, it would have been rejected, and a couple people questioned um, the history of capital projects in the school district uh and you know why why we vote on these kind of projects um spending on building projects uh and we don't vote on similar projects in, in other municipalities for instance the village and the town they, they don't go out to a vote on it necessarily um, we can talk about that and the history of it has any capital project ever failed and um, i don't have the answer to that yet i'm still trying to do some research but we can talk a little bit about that as well as, as uh, there's been um, some great discussion about uh, the state's uh, mandate or rules about using Native American imagery and names and mascots, but also not just Native American mascots um, and names uh, have gotten um, some uh, uh, criticism over the years and some discussion. Um, even our own Blue Devil here in East Aurora has had some discussion over the years. So that we'll talk about as well. I figured that would be good. Um, to talk about next week or the week after. But this week I wanted to, you know, we're the week before Christmas. I don't want to go too deep into history. So there's always a time and place to talk about those deeper topics, and I promise we will. Uh, but I did get a couple great questions. So one of the things I threw out there was, you know, what was it like, what was Christmas like for our earliest uh, uh, residents here in, in our small town? And uh, what was Christmas like in the 1800s here? And um, and I got a couple questions also, one question, um, one person asking a couple questions about New Year's Eve, so we can talk a little bit about that. But as for, um, I wish I had a lot to tell you about Christmas in the 1800s. Um, what was it like? Not a lot. Uh, we have to remember that a lot of the Christmas traditions that we have today are actually new traditions. So the Christmas tree, for instance, wasn't something that the early 1800s um, pioneer settlers or even the Civil War time, they wouldn't have had a Christmas tree, that idea of bringing a tree in. That came over from England, allegedly came over from England, from Germany, those, those traditions. Um, so when you think, when you, to put it in perspective, when you think about our, you know, the mid 1800s, a lot of the traditions, the, Chris, the hoopla essentially over Christmas, um, and buying presents and all that didn't exist for our earliest folks that were here. So in Millard Fillmore's time, uh, 1820s, 1830s, 1840s, it wasn't as big of um, a production as we make Christmas today. Uh, it really was after the Civil War that you start seeing um, a change. And one of the, the things, one of the resources I used um, is a Mr. Bragg lived out in the South Wales area, and he kept a diary. I refer to him a lot because um, he kept a diary, and he uh, every almost every day of his life. And so we have uh, transcripts. Someone, in addition to him writing the diary, someone transcribed all the all the journal entries. And we didn't have a newspaper for many of the years that he wrote about. And he lived out in the rural area up in South Wales, so um, uh, he kept a log of essentially a log of all the marriages and births and deaths but i was i i went into his um into his journal to try to figure out well what was he doing on christmas just to see what christmas would have been like and that's how i can tell you not a whole lot now mind you he lived in the in the rural areas but he wouldn't you know come to town to see the christmas decorations and in fact on christmas day there wouldn't be a mention of christmas before christmas 
Uh, so it wasn't as if there were a bunch of Christmas events happening. Um, so in the 1840s, he actually would just make a note, Christmas, period. And then said he went off to visit um, uh, either a relative. And in one instance, he had talked about going to dinner um, at a relative's house. But he, and then one, he went, went traveling somewhere and he couldn't get back before dark. So he ended up staying Christmas night overnight. But it wasn't as if it was a celebration. It was just out of necessity. So uh, Christmas was important enough that he mentioned it and it had a religious purpose for many people, of course, as it still does today. But it was all the, you know, for all intents and purposes, just a regular day in the 1840s. Now I looked later in the 1880s and his entries in the 1880s and it kind of shifted a little bit. And you'll see that also in the newspapers. They have a lot of uh, newspaper ads, uh, uh, trying to, the local stores trying to sell you things. Now mind you, that also switched because we got the railroad in the 1860s. So a lot of goods could come into the community, a lot of stores could pop up and the commercialism came along with it. Um, so that switched sort of the thinking about what Christmas uh, was and the idea of Christmas shopping and Christmas um, toys and gifts. And that was after the Civil War. And you'll, you can just see it in the newspapers how it, it starts the stores putting ads in, in the paper um, to try to get you to buy. Um, and of course the train catalog shopping that came along later too with the train coming through in the 1860s. Um, that kind of changed everything. Uh, so you see that shift in the 1800s to that. Um, but even then, there wasn't this big, you know, we start Christmas even before Thanksgiving and we have uh, Christmas bazaars and Christmas events and, the, you know, uh, movies at the theater and Carol Cade. You know, we have big events surrounding Christmas. But back then, he did mention Christmas in the 1880s. And uh, actually, one of the entries he talks about is going to the South Wales Community Hall, not the community hall that's there now. It would have been one that was there before. And they would slay down to the community hall. And they a bunch of people would from the neighborhood, from that area of town, um, got together and had a Christmas um, event, like a dinner, um, probably um, just a gathering. And he mentions this in his journal. But other than that, there wasn't anything he didn't mention Christmas from November or even October. You know, a lot of us, once Halloween's done, we're talking about Christmas, Christmas decorations, things like that. It would have been much simpler, as you, and you don't need a historian like me to tell you that, um, but it was much simpler and it's confirmed. But really after, after um, the Civil War, things started to uh, change a little bit. And then we notice after World War I, things changed and there was a lot more commercialism. But we do have to remember when you're putting it in context today, it's very difficult to imagine Christmas without Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. That was a product of uh, Montgomery Ward and uh, Rudolph was not helping Santa Claus uh, in the earliest days. So that's a relatively new concept. Uh, the idea of Santa Claus, the imagery we see Santa Claus today is a very modern concept. Saint Nicholas, Father Christmas before that, but this idea of Santa Claus today and going to a store and your children seeing one of Santa's helpers um, and telling Santa what you want, that, that's a fairly new concept. So folks in the 1800s, they just didn't have the same concept of Christmas that we do, which is hard to imagine, right? Uh, after World War II is when the Christmas lights, um, actually it was before that, excuse me, the Christmas lights came about. World War II, they had, we had talked about a couple weeks ago, they had to actually not do Christmas lights um, because of the war effort. But some of these things that we do, and of course inflatable decorations were not, though that's a very modern concept. Um, but our idea of Christmas and um, how we celebrate it is, is much different than it would have been for folks um, back in the 1800s. So um, it's when you read about people, when you think about your great, great grandparents, um, their Christmas was different. And it's hard to imagine, but like even in the late 1800s, the idea of cutting a Christmas tree down and bringing it into your house, that was just a foreign concept. And it actually wasn't introduced to the United States until after um, it was popularized by the royal family um, in the mid 1800s. So, um, you know, the, the early settlers of East Aurora would not have had a Christmas tree. And it's, you know, um, that's it's hard to picture Christmas without a Christmas tree, right? But that idea is, is fairly modern. Um, so, uh, so 1800s, that's how they celebrated Christmas. We moved into the we move into the 20th century, and I got I get a lot of questions about Christmas decorations and Christmas decorating, um, and as a civic 
thing and also events, civic events. And um, it really, after World War II, um, the, I, there was a push to really make Christmas decorating and a, a civic effort for Christmas that really was pushed after World War II. And the reason is, is because we didn't have, we weren't allowed to have decorations and lights during um, the war. So um, they, the, the production of Christmas lights wasn't there and uh, it was hard enough to get Christmas lights, but then uh, the, the, they rightfully so said during the war that they needed to put efforts, manufacturing efforts toward Christmas or toward uh, the war and not toward things like Christmas lights um, and to conserve energy as well. So they didn't have Christmas lights on Main Street in East Aurora and they didn't have Christmas lights on many in many towns. Um, uh, because the government didn't necessarily ban it, but they it, there was a lot of peer pressure <laughs> and government pressure to not do Christmas lights in communities. So they didn't. So after the war was over, you'll see uh, um, after rationing ended, and again, it took several years for the system to get back working the way it should. You see in the early 1950s um, efforts, including here in East Aurora, to um, decorate Main Street. And one of the things I found fascinating, and I'll, I'll try to put the article up, I wrote about this, I just researched a couple years ago about decorating, you know, the history of decorating Main Street, um, is groups of the government would try, the village board would try to, you know, get efforts, the board of trade, which was men, um, a group of local businessmen would try to um, sponsor, um, but it was a group of women uh, from East Aurora that got together and said, we need Christmas decorations. And so in the 1950s, they actually went door to door. Uh, we talked a few weeks ago about the library and how it really was a group of moms and women who went around door to door to get the library, um, to fund the library in town. Well, the same thing happened with Christmas decorations. And people, um, a group of moms uh, wanted to see Christmas decorations in East Aurora, and they went around and funded, and they had a committee um, and they and they funded Christmas decorations, um, but one of the uh, and then it it went um, and built from there. And each each year you would see something different. And what I found fascinating is some of the things they would do. They would put lights in the trees and they would hang banners. But sometimes it was just a, and I say it's a simple thing, but it would be like a simple um, uh, project. Once one project that sort of made a big statement. So you could put lights in all the trees on Main Street, but what they did one year was, um, well, a couple years, but in the 1950s, they funded a, um, a, a big star on the Griggs and Ball building. Now, that's a big project and there's electricity involved and, you know, I'm not the one hoisting that star up on the top of the Griggs and Ball building. Um, but, and so there was a community effort, but it was a simple thing, a simple concept. Um, it took a lot of work, but that's sort of what was happening is that you could make a statement at Christmas um, and and put um, a star on the Griggs and Ball building. And it was something people still remember. People still talk to me about that who were around back then in the 1950s and 60s. They talk to me about the star on the, on the Griggs and Ball building um, or a single tree down at the circle. And a lot of it was a community effort. And the Board of Trade, which was the precursor to the Chamber of Commerce, was involved with this um, and they would decorate. Um, this, it kind of waned a little bit, and this is what happens. They st just kept putting the same decorations up year after year. And in the 1970s, um, and there's a connection to today on this, but in, um, coincidentally, um, in 1972, there was an effort um, to basically revive Chris and spruce up and bring new life to the Christmas decorations here in East Aurora. And it was simply a, a group of local merchants and civic leaders who got together and said, we kind of want to make Main Street come alive at Christmas because they kind of had seen that the committee had, that had been doing it kind of fell apart and they were just, you know, putting simple decorations up and, and, and it didn't impress a lot of people. They were old decorations. But what I found impressive is that they this group got together um, and the Viddlers were involved with this and a lot of other um, merchants on Main Street. And they um, were tr really trying to get new Christmas decorations um, in 1971. And as I was researching, I, found, I came across an article that said a new Christmas view for 72, but it was an, an article from November 1971. And I thought it was a typo. Well, in fact, it was this group got together and realized 
you know, as they were preparing for Christmas in 1971, that they really wanted new Christmas decorations. But they were not under the impression, they did not kid themselves and think that they could pull it off for Christmas that year. So they, they looked ahead and they said, oh, well, if we, we they kind of took advantage of the Christmas spirit in 1971 in order to raise funds um, and, and get people excited for Christmas 1972. So they got, and you've heard me talk about him a lot, Rick Jennings, the artist, he designed all these wooden um, signs, banners, essentially, that they put along Main Street. And they got, um, they, they did a coloring contest for, uh, for kids. Um, they really got the spirit moving in 1971 for their new Christmas view, they called it in 72. Um, and the lesson I learned from history on this, and I always like to talk about that, is what can we learn from history is um, planning ahead. Uh, we hear a lot, um, and I even have ideas for Christmas time, and we think of them at Christmas, right? So right now, this week before Christmas, I have a ton of ideas, and I hear people talking about, well, we should do this in our community, or wouldn't it be great if we have a, you know, a Christmas concert, or we do this, or a Christmas lighting, or you name it, any Christmas event. But we think about it the week before Christmas, right? And sometimes we try think we have we can try to pull it off <laughs> for that Christmas when in fact it's like, nope, write it down and start planning ahead for the next Christmas. And that's what I learned from these folks in the 1970s is they they planned ahead, worked really hard to make sure that um, Christmas of 1972 uh, was the best that they could do and they needed time to do it. And, uh, and it worked. So those banners that uh, were put up and that new view for 1972, they had them all made ahead of time. They weren't waiting till the last minute. They weren't thinking about Christmas in November. You really need to think about it in January, February, March, even in the summer. Um, and it worked. And so those banners that were put up on Main Street, actually the, the modern fabric banners that we have on Main Street, if you look at the design of them, they're inspired by the Rick's Jennings ones from 1972. Um, so, and that's, you see this in many communities where um, you look at their, their Christmas decorating and it's really impressive. And, and I often think, oh, these folks, they, you go to other villages and you're like, oh, they planned ahead. You know, you could totally tell that they didn't wait till the last minute to be um, doing their Christmas decorating. So um, I learned that from the 1970s um, and uh, a group, and, and a lot of times, you know, you'll get like a, the, an official committee together or um, and, and they don't get a lot done sometimes um, sometimes they do uh, but a lot of times it was just a group of people who saw a need and got together a group of moms in, in the case of the 1950s who saw a need and they just went around and raised money for it and again just the lesson to learn um, you know you can't start planning Christmas in November so that's what I learned from them um, and that's how we um, a lot of times celebrated Christmas here in East Aurora get a lot of questions about um, the, the lights that went across Main Street, um, and I have an appreciation for, they used to string lights across Main Street uh, by Vidler's and the theater, and uh, it looked gorgeous, and there is actually an effort to bring that back, but I have an appreciation, and I'm not involved in this, um, in this project, but um, I have an appreciation when I see those old pictures of how much effort goes into this community planning, um, because it's not just you know, there's a lot of logistic, a lot of logistical issues that go on with that. And there were back then, too. It's not a new phenomenon. So um, to, to do Christmas decorations, it takes time, takes effort, um, takes sometimes a couple years to, to, to come to fruition. And so when I see those old nostalgic pictures, I kind of like, oh, that's beautiful at Christmas time. The Main Street looks beautiful. But I think also about the community effort and the people that actually did the work and raised the money. You know, the electricity costs money and it's not free. Electricity is not free. The lights aren't free and the labor to put them up isn't free and the insurance and all that stuff. And uh, that's not a new thing. That's that was existed back then, too. Um, so the, I have an appreciation when I look at these nostalgic pictures of, of the effort that went into the Christmas decorations and the civic um, efforts that went into the holidays here in, in not just East Aurora, but any small town. So I, I often um, think about that when I'm, I'm looking at the old pictures. Another question I got was about um, how East Aurora celebrates New Year's Eve. And yet again, that was a that's a rather new concept um, of staying up till midnight and um, and counting down to the new year. Now there'd be watch parties at at churches, and they would I call them a, a, a 
parties, but there were watch nights. And so people would pray and there'd be special church services on New Year's Eve. But the concept of a party leading up to um, up to midnight is fairly new. And looking back at uh, and a lot of times the 1800s, some of the records we have of, of parties was mostly on New Year's Day. So they would have a dinner on New Year's Day um, and bring in the new year. And so it was more of the op opposite of kind of what we do now. Even in the 1920s, so after World War um, World War I, uh, the Roycroft Inn hosted um, New Year's Eve parties. And there was actually the Board of Trade, which was the precursor to the um, Chamber of Commerce again. But they had a building at the corner of Main and Payne Street where the police station is now. And it was a, it's a, a, a large house, essentially. But there's also a gymnasium connected to it where the Boys and Girls Club is today. And they, would, they had a, um, a party that they advertised in the 1920s to ring in the new, to ring in the new year. And we, that concept of ringing in the new year comes from churches would ring their bells um, at, at the new year. Um, but what I found fascinating is the party didn't start till midnight. The band didn't even start. They'd have all night dancing, but the band would start at midnight. So today we kind of go to a New Year's party, what, eight, nine o'clock, and the highlight of the evening is the ball drop at midnight, watching it on TV and counting down um, to midnight. Back then, 1920s even, they would wait till midnight to really get the party going. And the all the parties I that were advertised in Easter advertised at the Roycroft Inn, um, they'd have a dinner maybe on New Year's Eve, but the, the dancing and the music would get get going at midnight and the whole um draw of it was how late you could stay up or how early you could stay up and the um in the morning they would have a breakfast and you would um, dance all night and have a breakfast in the morning and welcome the, the the sunrise essentially the next day so i think and some of us still do this um but i think a lot of uh, the focus has switched from um before midnight to midnight to you know we do that Back then, they were sort of focusing on after midnight and ringing in the new year with dancing, not leading up to midnight. And I was just reading an article about the concept of a countdown. Um, and again, you have to remember in the 1920s, there would not, you wouldn't, so the idea of counting down to midnight was a little different because we couldn't, we didn't have TV, we didn't have radio in the early, the 1910s to, to count down. So we weren't, no one would, yeah, there was a ball drop happening um, since the, uh, in Times Square at the time, but there was no way for people around the world to see it unless you were in Times Square. So again, we gather around a TV, essentially, to watch the ball drop, whether we're at a party or at home, um, that wasn't happening. So the idea of the midnight countdown um, it didn't exist as it does today. Um, and there's this fascinating article I was reading recently about the idea of countdown and how we do in Times Square and even at our parties where we go, you know, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, Happy New Year. That's a very new concept. And they, this um, this researcher, and I'll try to find it and post it, she was uh, trying to find out the first time they did a countdown associated with the ball drop in New York City, that the ball would drop and there wouldn't be the 10, 9, 8. And it would, she actually traces it to around the same time that the, um, the space shuttles and uh, the moon... Um, the lunar um, uh, missions were going to the moon where they would have countdowns. And so she's connecting it. She was connecting it to, you know, this concept of the countdown came from the space um, end of things and we connected it to, to, to New Year's Eve. Um, not sure if that connection um, is actually true, uh, you know, but she makes that connection. But the concept of, you know, you think about it, watching a ball drop, in the early days um, that, that just wasn't there. And so we connect so much of our, even here in, in little old East Aurora, we connect so much of our New Year's Eve celebration to watching the ball drop or uh, an event associated with the ball drop when in fact in the early days that wasn't the case at all. Um, so New Year's Eve was a little different, but what I found um, fascinating was that the parties didn't really get started until um, until midnight, not before midnight, which is was, was very interesting to me. Um, uh, but also, uh, the, the, that was the 1920s, and um, I, I sort of noticed that as I was going through checking out when I was doing research several years ago on New Year's Eve, is that they kind of faded away, these parties, and I was wondering, well, you know, Prohibition comes along, and that kind of 
puts a damper on New Year's parties, right? Um, and also, after Prohibition, even after Prohibition um, went away, uh, there, there were a lot more restrictions on, um, on liquor licenses and things like that. So in the 1950s and 60s, you'll see in the newspaper um, that there was one article in particular where they had said that the party wouldn't, couldn't go all night because the liquor authority wouldn't uh, give a license for people to drink that late. So, it, you know, they couldn't have an all-night party. You could have a party without alcohol, but that really impacted um, how we partied on New Year's Eve and how late um, a, a place could stay open. There were still also, you know, restrictions on things like dancing and stuff, and if, if, if and the blue laws. So if, if New Year's um, Day landed on a Sunday, it would impact the party, and there was actually in one case um, I found in the 1920s where the New Year's party was held the next day. So because they didn't want to get, in, you know, the way the New Year's landed, that they didn't want to get mixed up in the blue laws on a Sunday. Um, so that was pretty fascinating too. But um, New Year's is just, again, much, we think that, oh, we've done this this way forever. This is how New Year's has been celebrated when in fact, it's really the last century that really um, it seems that New Year's is celebrated the way um, the way we do it today. But um, uh, think about, I always think, I, I'm going to be thinking about that on New Year's is like, you know, the, the, the focus at midnight is on the television and watching a ball drop somewhere else for a lot of us. But imagine if that wasn't even there. There was no television, there was no radio even to count you down. Um, it, the countdown was less of a, a less of a um, important part of New Year's. And I think it was also more of a... Um, less of a saying goodbye to the old year and welcoming the new year, hence having uh, New Year's Day, um, a celebration, a dinner, and having a focus on after midnight. So I think that was just a different mindset. Um, and, and without a countdown uh, at midnight, that was, <laughs> that was uh, probably more apropos for a party. Um, and then uh, staying up till the next morning. So I don't do that. I can't stay up till the next morning. So I give credit to the people back in 1922 that did that, um, or 1921. And, I, and the Roycroft did have um, uh, an annual party, um, and they would have a dinner on, on New Year's Eve, but the party again would start after the new year. So um, I think that's the, the questions I had gotten. Um, and again, um, when you, context is everything. When you think about studying something, so I simply was studying Christmas and New Year's. Um, this was a couple years ago. I was working on different articles and different things, and I just um, the concept of of, of uh, Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer and some of the Christmas carols we sing today are modern Christmas carols. Um, and if you look at the you know try to put history into context, um, you know Silent Night is an old one, the First Noel, some of these old ones, but some of even the songs that seem like they've been around forever have not been around forever, um, and the concepts of Christmas um, are newer um, than we think. So the folks, if you're trying to place yourself in, into somebody who was living here in the 1800s, um, you know, the idea that Christmas wasn't a month-long event like it is today, um, and uh, the commercialism and, and how the trains, actually the trains coming through town and the ability to get products and have stores with, with um, uh, things to sell and expendable income. Um, you know, the Mr. Bragg who wrote the, his journal, he does not mention Christmas presents. I don't see Christmas presents talked about what he doesn't put in his journal, what he got for Christmas um, or what he gave for Christmas. He talks about going to a party on Christmas Day, but that was the 1880s. So even earlier than that, he was just going about his day. So this concept, um, these concepts of multiple presents and, you know, going um, to multiple places, they just couldn't do it. Um, but, um, and the Christmas tree and those symbols um, and Santa Claus and, and the, how we see St. Nicholas today and Santa Claus and that story are much more modern. So um, just think about that. If you're thinking about what Christmas would have been like in the old days, you kind of kind of have to scrap everything that you've learned <laughs> or that we're used to. Um, and, and it's so easy to Google today to find out when something, um, when something came about. Um, and uh, and our ideas and our traditions and when they came about, they're probably more modern than we think. And that the people 
even 50 years ago would not have a concept of what we do today at Christmas time. So it's interesting to think of it that way. So we're running out of time. I thank you for joining me again. I always enjoy doing these. And uh, again, I know um, Christmas might be tough for some people, but um, uh, but uh, Merry Christmas and hope you have a good one. And it's been a great season so far. Um, we're expecting a big snowstorm this weekend. Um, and so hopefully everybody is safe um, out there as they travel around and, um, and hope you have a wonderful Christmas. And I'll see you in, we are gonna, we'll chat next week. Um, um, and we'll uh, between the holidays and uh, but um, I won't talk to you before Christmas so thank you and uh, again please put your comments and questions um, even after this is live I like to get the comments and questions and if you're not comfortable putting them publicly in the comments um, I accept the the messages privately just just the same so I appreciate it um, and again Merry Christmas and uh, stay well thank you